So uh, it's really great to see such an incredible turnout. Uh, and I'm particularly excited about uh, this panel on race, economic, uh, economic inequality, and social mobility. Uh, we have three great panelists who I'm going to give precisely 20 minutes to speak. Uh, and then we'll get to open it up for uh, question and answer. So uh, keep your questions uh, brewing and I'll uh, facilitate that. Uh, first, we have uh, Derek Hamilton, who's going to present The Eco uh, Economist's Burden, Why Studying Hard and Working Hard Ain't Enough for Black Americans. Uh, Derek is an Associate Professor of Economics and Urban Policy at the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy in the Department of Economics at the New School for Social Research at the New School in New York City. He's also an Oberlin graduate, uh, so a little shout out for Oberlin. Professor Hamilton is a stratification economist whose work focuses on the causes, consequences, and remedies of racial and ethnic inequality in economic and health outcomes. Besides authoring numerous scholarly articles on social, socioeconomic stratification and education, marriage, wealth, homeownership, and health, uh, he, with, uh, along with William Darity, was recognized as one of Political Magazine's top 50, working in the area to end involuntary unemployment via federal jobs guarantee. Uh, Becky Pettit is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas, Austin. She's a sociologist trained in demographic methods with interests in social inequality broadly defined. Uh, besides many, many uh, scholarly articles in uh, top journals in sociology, her most recent book, Invisible Men, Mass Incarceration and the Myth of Black Progress, investigates how decades of growth in Americans' prisons and jails obscure basic accounts of racial inequality. She's won many awards, and her work has appeared in such uh, uh, media outlets as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and MSN. NBC. Uh, William Elliott is a professor here uh, at the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan. Uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Elliott's first year and we were really excited to bring him to campus. Uh, he's also the founder of the Center on Assets, Education, and Inclusion. He's a non-resident senior research fellow for New America's Asset Building Program and a leading researcher in the fields of children's savings in college debt. If you're interested in individual development accounts or child development accounts, I think Willie might be running every single, every single evaluation going on around the country in this area. Uh, he's, his work, uh, beyond also uh, getting numerous awards, this seems to be a theme with our panelists, uh, his uh, work has appeared in the National Journal, PBS NewsHour, US News and World Reports, Washington Monthly, and the Washington Post. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our first panelist, uh, Professor Derek Hamilton. Well, I, I guess I'm going to start by giving thanks to Hakeem and Stephen for organizing this event and uh, putting up with my carelessness in responding. I'm, I'm trifling, but thank you for putting up with me. Um, this is always a special moment for me when I come back to this campus. I did a postdoc here probably about 15 years ago with the program for research on black Americans and the Poverty Center. Um, so it, it always feels like a homecoming even if I'm not here that often. Um, and you know, it, it is always special presenting to the University of Michigan because of all that they've done for personally for me and my development. There are two people in this room that were here when I first came that I'm going to single out real quick and that's uh, Vince Hutchings, who was my roommate for a period of time, and uh, Chris Seifert, they, they've been here for the longest and have been my friends throughout the years. Um, I'm not going to take up all my time with, with announcements, but it's also an honor to share the stage with Willie, Becky, and Luke. So um, with that said, let me get into the talk. So the title, The Economist's Burden, Why Studying Hard and Working Hard Ain't Enough for Black Americans. Clearly, I'm going to take some jabs at, at my my discipline, economics, and their complicity in this continuing paradigm of inequality. So across the globe, people live in environments of reinforcing inequality, vulnerabilities, obstacles of social mobility, political and political inclusion. The list of despair includes wealth and income disparity, unemployment, underemployment, exposure to economic downturn, income, work hour, 
and expense volatility, vulnerability to predatory finance that results from budgetary shortfalls and lack of financial cushions, a shift from corporate and government social insurance onto households and individual private insurance, intergenerational transfers of affluence and poverty, increasing demands of care work and in vivo transfers to less well-off family and friends, wealth stripping from municipal fines, fees, and debt collection so that municipalities may balance their local budgets, mass incarceration, food insecurity, environmental injustice, and vulnerability to climate fluctuation from natural disaster, and the physical and mental harm resulting from social psychological stress via stigma, stereotype threat, overexertion, implicit bias, and micro and macro aggressions. These vulnerabilities are more pronounced for economically marginalized and socially stigmatized group. The vulnerabilities disproportionately fall on women, blacks, and other non-whites. Their employment and earnings are more precarious, and they tend to have more caregiving and financial responsibilities. The popular French economist Thomas Piketty characterizes these growing worldwide co contexts of structural inequality as largely locked in at birth as a result of laws, policies, institutions, and economic arrangement. It is in this context in which the Reverend Dr. William Barber, a leader of the Moral Mondays movement, proclaims that economic justice is a moral imperative. In this vein, we need to reassess how we measure societal economic health and emphasize economic empowerment and social inclusion to address our daunting problems of social inequality. While conservatives tend to focus on growth and ignore equity altogether, progressives often frame their equity arguments on the grounds of economic productivity. Such arguments may be valid, but they're context specific. In the 21st century, why do we continue to couch basic human decency in terms of economic productivity and growth? We need to prioritize economic equity, fairness, and what the Nobel laureate economist Amartya Sen calls human capabilities, where we measure our national economic health by how well we enable all our citizens to attain their self-defined goals. This sentiment is in contrast with our emerging economic priorities around austerity and economic growth, which leaves workers vulnerable to the fickle contingency of trickle-down job creation, while economic equity, fairness, and human capabilities continue to take a distant backseat. The economic profession and its so-called positivist approach and free market dogma are culpable in advancing this paradigm. The term political economist has become an albatross, as if the field is somehow scientifically weaker and less objective than plain old economics. One need not sacrifice rigor to study how institutions and behavior intertwine with an objective of building economic inclusion. Likewise, we all need to recognize that all scholarship is rooted in norms, especially scholarship that claims to study production, transactions, and distributions. The dogma of my profession is based on a faith that markets are somehow natural, transparent, efficient, and inevitable. This leads to a false notion of fairness, that somehow if each individual is free to pursue their own profit and happiness, then that, then that will ultimately lead to the greater good for society. Markets, whether they're product markets, labor markets, or financial markets, are presumed to be self-regulating. The most astute, the most valued, and the hardest workers are believed to prosper and endure, while the least astute, the least valued, and the laziest are presumed to receive their just rewards and simply fade away or have to find something else to do over time. These presumptions pay little attention to the roles of power and initial endowment or capital and how that power and capital can adjust to alter the rules and structures of transactions, i.e. markets, to privilege power and capital in the first place. It is silly to presume or assume that those with power and capital are simply price takers. Economists should do a better job understanding political economy, including power and initial endowment, and be more keenly focused on understanding and advancing for structures that truly lead to more equitable and fair distributions. 
Without such an analysis, my profession is more than complicit in the continued tra trajectory towards stratification both within and across nation state. Indeed, it might not be surprising that the paucity of students from subaltern backgrounds study economics. Ultimately, orthodox explanations for persistent racial discrimination typically reduce to some collective group-based human capital or cultural ineptitude or dysfunction on the part of blacks, Latinos, and other subaltern group members. My profession has fallen short in understanding the role of group identity such as race, gender, and their intersections as they relate to material and psychological well-being. In contrast, stratification economics and critical race theory recognize that identities are multifaceted, not dichotomous. As such, there are incentives to members of out-group to identify within the in-group, and in the American context, that would be the white group, and that there are tangible material and psychological benefits associated with white privilege and the property rights and whiteness. For example, high achieving black Americans as measured by education still exhibit large economic and health disparities relative to their white peers. The fact that blacks who live in families where the head graduated from college typically have only two thirds the wealth of white families where the head dropped out of high school is an example of the property rights and whiteness. Other examples include Diva Pager's study that demonstrates that white males that signal prior incarceration have greater rates of employment callbacks than black males who signal no prior incarceration. And the fact that black expectant mothers who graduated from college have a greater likelihood of an infant mortality than white expectant mothers who dropped out of high school. In terms of economic security, wealth provides both the beginning and the end. It is the primary indicator of security. Wealth provides financial agency over one's life. Simply put, wealth gives you, gives you choice. It provides economic security to take risk and to shield against financial loss. The top 10% of households hold about three quarters of the nation's wealth, while the bottom half of households owns only about 1%. But when it comes to wealth, race is an e even stronger predictor than class itself. There virtually is no black middle class if we define it in terms of wealth. The survey of consumer finance indicates that black households have a median wealth of about $17,000. That's inclusive of home ownership, home equity. In contrast, it's about $171,000, or 10 times that amount, for white households. The racial wealth gap is an inheritance that begins with chattel slavery, when blacks literally served as the capital assets for a white land-owning plantation class. Much of the framing around wealth disparity, including the use of alternative financial services, products, focuses on poor choices and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino, and poor borrowers. It's often tied to a cultural poverty thesis regarding an undervalue and low acquisition of education. Hence, the presumption is that if a greater share of black and Latinos invested more in a good education, which in turn would result in better jobs and higher income, then the racial wealth disparity would dramatically be reduced or eliminated altogether. We know that education is positively associated with better health and economic outcomes for all Americans. However, racial disparity in health and wealth persists and even worsens at higher levels of education. In essence, education is not the anecdote to the enormous racial gaps in health and economics. This does not diminish the value of education. There's a clear intrinsic value to education along with a public responsibility to expose everyone with a high quality education that teaches them to synthesize and fuse information into big ideas with encouraging teachers trained to deliver that curriculum from grade school all the way through college. It has been a myth that black families do not value education but also pro problematic is the societal overemphasis on the economic returns to education as the panacea to address socially established structural barriers of racial economic inclusion. Nonetheless, political discourse upheld by Democrats, Republicans, 
blacks and whites alike emphasizes education, motivation, and personal responsibility on the part of blacks as the explanation for the racial divide. This follows from a neoliberal perspective where the free market, as long as individual agents are properly incentivized, is supposed to be the solution to all our problems, whether they're economic or otherwise. The political scientists Joe Sauce, Richard Fording, and Sanford Tram, in their seminal book, Disciplining the Plur, describes the emergent neoliberal paternalism where the state serves the paradoxical role of structuring most aspects of society to adhere to a laissez-faire market tenant, while at the same time serving the role of what they characterize as poverty governance. Here the state uses incentives and sanctions to coerce or discipline the underclass, not working to eliminate poverty, but rather to manage seemingly bad behavior with increasingly punitive tactics. Stigmatization based on race provides the political father to implement harsh and punitive control of the underclass because of their marginalized social status and overrepresentation in poverty. Blacks become the symbolism by which this surplus population characterized as persistently unemployed and unemployable, a source of urban crime and malice, and whose subsistent needs are considered a drain on fiscal budgets becomes defined. The neoliberal paternalistic frame provides the rationale for austerity policies. If behavioral modification, particularly with regards to personal and human capital investment, is the central issue, why fund government agencies and programs which at best misallocate resources to irresponsible individuals and at worst create further dependencies to fuel irresponsible behavior. Some examples of these neoliberal policy examples that control and manage surplus populations, they were given earlier. For instance, Megan mentioned the black codes, but we can, always, we can also go back to the British poor laws in the 19th century as examples. Some more common examples that are going on today, although those ones that I mentioned are pretty common too, would be income maintenance programs, not trying to eliminate, but again, provide subsistence to poor people, social isolation, which would include segregation, mass incarceration, policies aimed at reproduction, fertility, and family formation, and then social experimentation. We can group moving the opportunity in that, in that paradigm, but in addition, they would be more egregious ones like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. The cruel irony is that the post-racial politics and personal responsibility of these, of these tropes of involving no excuses, grit, and hard work, they may actually exacerbate economic and health disparity, particularly for those that pose a competitive threat to the preferred position of socially dominant group. There are physical and psychological costs of stigma and ironically exerting individual agency in discriminatory and racially stigmatized environments. Stratification economics looks beyond individual factors and investigates structural and contextual factors that preserve the relative status of dominant groups via intergenerational resource transfers and addressing exclusionary practices in their attempt to address intergroup inequality. So I, I think I got about three minutes left. I'm going to name 10 policies that I can go into in further depth in Q&A, and there's stuff written about them that I think that could bring about a new economic bill of rights to be, have inclusion of all Americans. First, we need reparations for slavery and Jim Crow, as well as exclusion from New Deal and post-World War policies. We need to get beyond, in order to get beyond the race problem, we need to acknowledge and redress the legacies of racial injustice. Second, baby bonds. The program is analogous to a social security program for young adults to provide capital finance to begin a lifetime of building assets and economic security independent of the financial positioning and decision making of the families in which they're born. Trust funds for everyone. Let every young adult have some capital finance to start a lifetime of building economic security. Federal job guarantee. It offers the economic security of a living wage to all citizens. It provides investment in public and phys physical and human infrastructure, and it provides an implicit floor on the wages and other worker amenities that the private sector can offer. It provides jobs for socially stigmatized workers. 
and it increases the bargaining for workers by giving all workers what I have as a tenured faculty member, removing the threat of unemployment. Federalized credit scores, a metric so determinate in individual life chances should not be left to the private sector. It should be transparent and it should have the accountability that goes with being an elected official. Postal banking, to provide banking services, short and long-term loans, particularly for underprivileged individuals who financially have to rely on predatory financial services. It basically puts a floor on what the private sector can offer in terms of financial products. The EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, should conduct employment audits to detect racial discrimination and prosecute discriminating firms. We should be proactive in detecting discrimination, not reactive. Subsidize HBCUs to the tune of the present value that was reached for colleges and universities from the post-World War II GI Bill, with some equated to the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe. It's evident that blacks still need stereotype safe environments that mitigate hostility and provide curriculum more relevant to their experiences. Almost done, sorry everybody. Eliminate tracking in grade school altogether. Offer universal talented and gifted educational programs to all. Single payer health insurance and tuition free public education. We should remove, I'm not calling them free educational free health care but we, we should remove the stigma and the threat of finance at the point of delivery of these important human capability things that are crucial for all Americans. We need to finally stop mass incarceration for nonviolent offenders and hold pr police criminally and civilly responsible for abusive police practices. Basically, the issues are more political than economic. We know what we can do. We need to move away from the empirically unsubstantiated neoliberal rhetoric that emphasizes a so-called collective dysfunction on the part of blacks and other subaltern surplus populations, and instead live up to the American promise of economic opportunity, upward mobility, and shared prosperity for all. Thank you.